Thank you, everyone. And uh, um, you know, I have uh, one of my research staff is is here at our new uh, global headquarters in Spring, uh, and she came to me via the uh, Intel Exascale program. But before that, she was at Exxon Mobil Research. And when she heard I got a chance to talk to you today, she was super excited. So I'm I'm really grateful for the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, so a little bit more about about the labs uh, and uh, why I'm standing here in the T-shirt. And you know, we have our advanced development programs, we have our global business units, and every day they are making our products better and better. But that's not my job. My job is to look out a little bit farther, that five to 10 year platform, uh, what do we need to pull together as a global research and advanced development uh, community working across all of those communities that you heard in my bio. and in. Uh, two things to note about Hewlett Packard Labs. One is we're always anchored in the business, so we're not an open-ended research organization. We're always thinking about areas in which Hewlett Packard Enterprise either has a market potential or where we believe that we could enter a new market uh, with, uh, with great uh, potential for uh, contribution. Uh, and that means that sometimes we are extending the work we're doing today. Sometimes it's contrarian. Even though we've always done something a certain way, what are those other ways? What are the next ways in which the same kinds of problems can be tackled or tackled at even greater scope and scale? So as far as uh, what, we, what we are constituted as, as you can see, we have AI ML research, we have our future system architectures, uh, novel accelerators in quantum, that's where I get to spend part of my day job, workflows, distributed systems, network fabrics, data management, security, silicon, and now especially, and this is kind of back to the future, understanding the sustainability, the energy of data movement, the energy of data transformation, the energy of data storage, and how we now begin to factor workflows over all of those considerations. And the other thing we'll say is, as you heard, I, I started in, if you could do the math, four, 10 plus uh, 25 is 35, so I've been here for a while, uh, but you know, if I came down to Palo Alto and visited Hewlett Packard Labs, Back in 1989, I could meet the team that was designing the PA risk architecture, the silicon process that went in, how we soldered those components down to circuit boards. Above that, operating system, libraries, middleware, HP terminals, HP disk drives, uh, HP printers, very vertically oriented. And that meant that innovation, Hewlett Packard Labs could go directly to our design teams, directly to our manufacturing teams, directly to our global services and support teams. Now, uh, the innovation ecosystem is global, diverse, vibrant, and so much more complex. Someone at Labs has a great idea. Okay, great. Uh, well, first, let's see, you're gonna get that introduced to TSMC? Uh, that's a challenge. Then, uh, oh, can you get uh, one of the semiconductor partners to adopt it? Challenge. Can you get a Linux kernel team to support it? There's another challenge. Can you get an open source framework to embrace it? And then it's ready to become part of our product. And that's what, really where I get to spend most of my day job, is understanding for something that's five or 10 years out, how can we pull together ingenuity, business opportunities, and then make the case for investment when investment isn't just going to talk to my CEO anymore. It's talking to global design, academic research, uh, government communities at the global scale to talk about how we're going to really pull these things together, not make, make those reasoned, not risk-free, but reasoned investments in how technology is gonna progress. So first we're gonna talk about the, pull out our telescopes and take the big picture view, and the second half we'll talk about, about the fine details and how we mesh these two extremes together. So first, uh, first mega trend, uh, the appetite for compute is voracious, and it, it's, you know, it, and it's really the entire span. Data, you know, in 13 years, 70x capacity, 20x capability and bandwidth, compute. 13 years, we got from petascale to exascale. Models, uh, in 10 years, 8,000x model size and 100x more models. And if you look and, and sort of aggregate all those things together, 300,000 times more compute consumed in the decade, and we're gonna, we're gonna get to a slide in a second where we'll see this is, this is sort of at the, at the emergence of AI, but now that AI is seeing ubiquitous potential adoption, we're gonna see all these things and go through the ceiling, and that either means you're gonna hit the ceiling or you're gonna change course so you can avoid it, uh, but something's gonna happen. And, 
And I think specifically for this group, and you know, we'll hear, you know, we heard the, for, the, for those of you who were available for the BOF this morning, it's like, oh yeah, preach brothers, because the same themes we heard, AI is a supercomputing problem, and so the question is, is this a, a kindred spirit? Are we going to be able to write a tailwind? Or are they going to consume all the oxygen and leave nothing else, and then they'll move on to something different, and we'll all be wondering what just blew past us? The second mega trend is, and look at the, the middle of this, is, is it's not just about simulation and modeling anymore. It is this overlap, massive data analytics, massive simulation and modeling, and then that last piece, that artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I guess I, I will continue to underline pervasive on, on all these things. It isn't just that I'm using a great little uh, discriminative model or a predictive model to, to replace and, and substitute out uh, one way of doing calculation for another. Using the models and the capabilities predictively to run the infrastructure at superhuman levels of efficiency. Incorporating the models all the way down to the sensor so that the intelligence and the agency of the scientist and the researcher is down there inside, inside of the hot zone, inside of the tokamak, inside of the telescope. So understanding that ubiquitous use of AI ML, as well as governing not only how we gather the data, how we discern the data, how we shape the data, running the physical infrastructure, running the campaign of modeling, but in the end also getting us those insights. You imagine that AI sitting on your shoulder, the digital muse that keeps tugging at your ear and you say, hey, did you notice? Did you notice this correlation, that correlation? Not that they will replace the, the scientists, but they will augment the scientists. And this is going to be one of these generational changes uh, that we'll see. And so just imagining, what does it take? And then for us, the real question is, what is it going to cost? What is it going to cost in terms of infrastructure, energy, training for us to embrace the possible future of completely augmented science and engineering, completely augmented uh, research and leadership teams, manufacturing capabilities? So there's going to be a, there was the then and there will be the now. But the question on all of this is can we afford to inference that much? Large applications that are emerging and, and this capability of pulling all these things together to have that exemplar of massive data analytics, massive simulation modeling, and that ability to utilize pervasively AI ML. We're looking at these first um, pioneering applications that are beginning to pull all this together. So the first one, digital twins, data center, fusion reactors, weather climate, manufacturing, more real than real. The thing that's amazing, if we can get to the linking, the massive sensor data coming in, constructing that digital twin, is that can put the printf statement in the simulation. I can't put it in the cell. I can't put it in the reactor. So that ability for us to reason over the simulations and have those digital twins mesh together and that using them interchangeably and with confidence is that first example of one something that's going to stretch all the way out all the way out to that messy, vulnerable edge, all the way back to our very benign data center with our high performance computing simulations and knitting them together and understanding that calculus of variations. How much should I compute out there on the edge? How much should I pull back to the data center? How are we gonna solve the, the laws of physics, the laws of economics, and our own human law in order to solve a problem and realizing now I'm doing all this while well, energy is dynamically priced and the understanding, is it better for me to run this now or in 10 minutes? How can I understand and reason over that calculus of variations in how I will reach a conclusion based on incredibly varied constraints that we just aren't used to yet? Second, those streaming instruments, massive amounts of information flowing, whether it's the, the square kilometer array, whether it's an array, of genomic sequencers, whether it is all the sensors clustered around that next particle experiment, incredible volumes of information thrown off so fast, we could never hope to speculatively backhaul all that information to a centralized location. And even if we did, you know, we would find ourselves unable to deal with all of that information in one place. Understanding how we then use that intelligence and discernment of the scientists and being able to push it all the way out 
to where the sensing is happening. So in millimeters, in nanoseconds, they are sifting through irrelevant noise from that, that insight that will lead you know, to that next human advancement. Generative science, synthetic biology, chemistry, protein folding, gen genomics, all of those things that we had been wondering, will we have to wait till quantum computing before we can realize these things? And the answer is no. That combination of classical modeling plus machine learning plus uh, uh, AI, that might actually give us not only the tools to understand and explore, but then fabricate and manufacture. And again, thinking about all these things, huge instruments, scientific sensing at one side, simulation and modeling, massive data analytics, not only for the data coming in from the, uh, from the analysis and the instruments, but also from the populations that are being affected and could be benefited by these synthetic solutions. Automated experiments, experimenting, and again, pulling in that first one, whether it is a physical experiment, whether it is a simulation, steering, understanding, how quickly can I decide, I, do I need to change course, do I need to zoom in? I can't look at the entire universe, I want to look at what's interesting to me, how can I quickly discern and find out where is the interesting area in the universe for me to search so that I don't have to look at very shallow depth over anything, I can focus in. And finally, distributed sensing and decision making. And you just have to think about this. Think about this in the energy context. You know, I'm sure your neighborhood is not dissimilar to mine. I'm out there in, in the foothills of, Sierra, of the Sierra Nevada mountains. And every summer, we have the worry that between 4 PM and 7 PM, they're going to brown us out. Because is there enough available energy? Well, we all have, a lot of us have uh, electric vehicles. A lot of us have solar on the roof. Understanding how we balance supply and demand, how we predict demand, how we shape demand, how we have all these things happen, and have them happen quickly enough in, to reach a solution, converge to a solution in a time that matters. Distributed sensing problem, distributed decision making problem. And it's not only that we can reason over enough information, get that insight into a time that matters. We then have to turn that around and drive that out to perhaps hundreds of millions, even billions of end decision points, whether that's shaping an individual or tuning a piece of equipment to match that demand, and then know with confidence, with measurable confidence, and that's not something I hope for, that's something I measure and use the power of statistical uh, mathematics to, to, to understand I achieve that property. How will I do that with confidence and transparency? Because what we need to make this all work is for people to buy in instead of opting out. So talking about AI ML. So what this is, and, and if you haven't seen epic.ai.org, I encourage everyone to go to the website. It's a fantastic resource. And this is, this is their data. And you can see that the, the regions the, on the vertical axis is um, the training compute. How many floating point operations do you need uh, to uh, complete one of these model trainings. You can see back in the day, uh, and we'll put on some, some, some touch points here. So one week of an iPhone. And you can see, well, one week of an iPhone, that would have got me back about a decade ago. And that means if I had an iPhone back in 2015, I could train 52 uh, cutting edge language models every year. Now we'll throw in, and we heard uh, from, uh, from uh, Dan that uh, this new eight uh, GPU um, server is going to cost you $98 an hour or a half, one and a half million for three years. Yeah, so, so if uh, for a week, that's $16,000, you can train one of the models. You can see again where you cut it out. And that's, that is just barely touching the foundation model capacity. So again, thinking about that ROI, you know, you just spent $16,000 in a week of time to generate a model one time. Are you going to make your nut back, right? And so much about what we're seeing in this large language model and this model economy is people who are speculatively investing in capital and energy and data hoping to get a return. Now, my personal opinion is that you're not going to get a lot of return by giving away Dolly images to my mom so she can generate pictures to put in her Christmas newsletter. You're going to want enterprise users. But you know the thing about enterprise users is they have risks that they have to mitigate. Understanding fitness for use for any of these is a huge question right now. 
So let's draw in the next one. Okay, there's, uh, there's Frontier. And you can see Frontier for a week, and there's still some triangles above that line. And we'll throw in this last one, a potential, the US executive order on AI. And they're having conversations, Department of Commerce is asking for opinions. And one of the opinions, is there a red line above which you should let the government know if you're training a model with this capacity? And there is a flops uh, suggestion. There's also a suggestion when you're training your model on some sensitive biological information as well. So understanding all those, and again, this is a ceiling. The question for all of us is, given these ceilings, given the incredible capital and operational costs, but this is where the money's flowing in. For traditional high-performance computing, who might actually care about all 64 bits of a result, is this a tailwind? Is this a headwind? Is this orthogonal? Is this going to leave us all gasping for oxygen? Or is this saying that, you know what, that's not tenable. What you've actually found is the top of the S curve. You need to find a different way. And so that's, again, the question. Is that different way going to advantage traditional simulation and modeling, or is it going to leave it, uh, leave it behind? So just to, to highlight a little bit about the, uh, the pervasiveness. So back in, uh, back in 2022 at the World Economic Forum meeting in Davos, Switzerland, we launched a, a, a toolkit. This is for you if you were the CTO, CIO, CEO, and you were the one person in your corner office suite who thought AI was going to be important, we gave you a toolkit so you could have a conversation with your peers. Now that was January of 2022, when, when being an AI enthusiast kind of made you maybe a little bit of a weirdo, at least in enterprise, enterprise C-suites. Then we had November. Okay, we had a little chat P33 launch. So that, that was November 22. So Davos was late in 23, it was in May, uh, but suddenly it was all hands on deck. And in June, we all met at the Presidio Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, and we had our re responsible generative AI um, conference. So in the short manner of, of, of a year and a half, we went from weirdo to pervasive. And again, this is not that it's being adopted, but it, the conversation is now happening ubiquitously. So this year, January of 24, we launched the AI house at Davos. There's a picture, and this is what every storefront that had been turned into a pop-up at Davos looked like. They must have run out of those two vowels uh, at the sign-making shop because this was everywhere. It was every conversation. We opened those doors at 7 a.m. every morning. We closed the doors at 10 p.m., except for the one that we had a party. We closed at 2 a.m. It was absolutely full, and it was an incredible, diverse cross-section. You know, it's kind of, it's almost a joke. What do you have when you have a panel session that has a princess, an astronaut, and a Nobel laureate all talking about AI? Again, want to emphasize how ubiquitously this is being considered, and again, the energy and capital and operational ramifications of satisfying this demand. Even if it is a bubble, we're going to have to live with the, when the bubble bursts. If it's not a bubble, then we have to live without outcome as well. So one thing that, that I found myself repeating over and over uh, this week was, was this formula, AI is disruptive, yes. It won't replace the, put your profession there, but professionals who understand and adopt it will replace those who don't. And I think that's, again, that is what people's mindset is right now. That is why there is this FOMO. Uh, AI is, is an overnight sensation, 60 plus years in the making. We finally had that convergence of capability and opportunity to digest literally all the world's information. And yet we left with the question, is this in fact still not fit for use for any particular application? Because all the concerns that we all know about, all the concerns about hallucination, all the concerns about accuracy, about uh, data uh, provenance, how do you know? And also, so definitely baby steps right now, but this is a big baby, and it is finding its way around the world really quickly. So again, just something for us to all consider as we're thinking about our possible futures. Uh, this isn't just an a elephant in the room anymore. It is a herd of elephants. So what are we left with in terms of the conversations? You know, we, we've delivered the Exascale system. We're waiting, and we got the next two online, you know, thinking about that. We wonder about what's happening over on the other side of the Pacific. 
Uh, as we think of what's next, you know, we want to bring all of these thoughts together. That edge to exascale workflow understanding. And so, wow, yeah, we could see, you know, straightforward. Hey, can we tack another zero onto, onto that? Add some more cabinets, change a little bit of what's in the cabinets. I think we have line of sight to that. But really, the understanding how we begin to anticipate multifaceted, complex workflows. You know, it's still the case. Those are very homogeneous systems. And even though we'll talk about our infrastructure being able to handle, you know, every, every viable CPU and GPU from all three vendors. Uh, and uh, still, that's not really heterogeneous. All those cabinets are still the same at every, on every floor. How do we begin to understand when we have all of this difference, when we have all this heterogeneous dimensions to the workflows, not just the individual workloads, those still have to be optimized, but now their interplay needs to be optimized and understanding that what used to happen on that benign raised floor might have to happen in the head of the drone or down a sensor at the bottom of a well, understanding how we begin to factor all of these things together and make it something that ordinary application developers, even with their AI augmentation, can begin to reason over design and construct. And then we think about you know, where we're going to, those federated diverse systems, understanding that it's not just diverse over, I get to choose AMD or Intel or NVIDIA, it's diverse across every possible dimension. Some of it is happening there in you know, FP8 or even integer. Some of you might have seen large language models in 1.58 bits per weight with just ternary, plus, minus, and zero, all the way out there at the edge. Edge systems, data center systems, cloud systems, it's gonna be yes, 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 yes. Which do I have to be proficient at? Yes is the answer to all of that. So that was the picture of, of those big, uh, Mega, uh, mega trends, the trend towards ubiquitous edge AI, the trend towards edge to cloud to exascale workflows, understanding how we begin to reason over incredibly dynamic energy and material inputs, understanding the full complexity and weight of data movement and data computation and data storage, whether that's happening all within a single super chip or it's covering the globe, being able to reason over those, operate all of those complex systems at superhuman level of efficiency. But in the end, it all has to be reduced down to practice. So I, I was looking uh, last night and I went back to the to 2008 um, Exascale computing study and uh, looking at some of the some of the tables and there will blow this one up there. You know, so the 2008 said that in seven years in 2015 when we achieve the exascale, oops, uh, but it's also going to take. Uh, let's see, what is this? Uh, 200 uh, component count. Oh yeah, 223,872 microprocessors. So that's a big number, and the fabric that's connecting them up. Similarly big, and so if we move from, from there, and then we think about, this is what we were proposing uh, back in 2017 for our exascale and multi-exascale architecture of Hewlett Packard Enterprise. We'd made some decisions, all liquid cooling everywhere, needing to remove that out to achieve not only the heat density transport, but the physical density to make any of those fiber runs possible. We also uh, we're banking on a novel fabric, uh, so moving towards a memory uh, semantic fabric, all photonic down to the chip. We bid, we bid on all three programs, and of course, we lost all three, and so we did the next best thing, which was to buy the winner. Uh, so <laughs> bravo to the, to the Cray team. Uh, but you know, it, again, reducing this from architectural principles, well-reasoned engineering plans to getting something up on the floor. Uh, I don't think it would have been possible if we hadn't actually had the Hewlett Packard Enterprise team, the SGI team, the Cray team all come together to achieve this outcome, uh, which was, you know, it was uh, quite, quite impressive. But what formed our ability at each time was that conversation, and if you think why, you know, when we talk about 2008 to 2017 to 2023, turning those systems on, 
it was the continuous conversation, and, and I think with, with all of the supply chain, but the other thing about this problem is I actually think if we think about the X scale, it was, it was fairly well contained. It was do what you're doing now a thousand times better, and here's your budget for energy. And can you make all the physics work? Can you make the economics work? Can you solve all of those elements of the equation? Uh, and, uh, and you know what the application is. Here's your benchmark. Uh, and so it was, it, was, it was certainly fantastic engineering at every level, from the lowest level semiconductors all the way up. But in some cases, in retrospect, it, it was done individually. It wasn't done necessarily holistically. And I think that's why I wanted to talk, when I talk about the, about the microarchitectures, is to introduce you to uh, the International Roadmap for Devices and Systems. So this is a roadmap. So when that original report was written in 2008, if you go back and look through the references, it references extensively the International Technical Roadmap for Semiconductors. And that was the international community, and it was the successor to the national technical roadmap for semiconductors. And it was all of those low-level details. What should I expect in featured size over time? What should I expect out of memory? What should I expect out of compute? What should I expect out of communications? And it went all the way up to essentially the gate level and a little bit of the packaging. And what the team realized as they, as they began to move forward, and this was done in conjunction with the international rebooting computing effort that came also out of the IEEE Computer Society, is we need to get these communities together because we no longer have the luxury of solving each of these elements individually and then concatenating the solution at the end. We need to begin to embrace holistic co-design and that is why at the very top of this, oh, so at the bottom, the bottom is all the people you, you know and love, lithography, yield enhancements, metrology, uh, health and safety, um, and material, um, material science, all of those low level things. But then they fill into the middle lever, outside system connectivity. How do we move, uh, how do we move information around, whether that is uh, between, uh, between uh, Conf uh, campuses on the globe, between uh, racks in the data center, between chips on the board, or between chiplets on the substrate. More and more, how much more can we count out of CMOS lithography? Beyond CMOS, what do we do? And when should we be entertaining more novel technology? CQIP is quantum packaging and integration. Think about that, that, those incredible Grace Hopper super chips from NVIDIA, that ability to pull together things and engineer what we used to do at the data center, then we did at the motherboard, now accomplished at the substrate, and on and on, those infrastructure IFT, a new layer about that next level up, but then at the top, applications and benchmarking and systems and architecture, and I get to actually co-chair the systems and architecture community, but what we do, it, applications and benchmarking, is giving us that, that information about what will we need to compute. Those algorithms, the kernels, and understanding about what is emerging, what new workloads, and we'll talk about that as point workloads. But then systems and architectures, my community, we begin to apply boundary conditions. We say, okay, we know what we need to compute. Now where is the where? Where is the how? What are the space, the weight, the power, the security, the privacy, the sustainability boundary conditions that we need to apply in order to understand how what we need to compute needs to then mesh up and understand at each level of those uh, of the successive IFTs down through the more and more or the beyond CMOS team. When is there going to be an opportunity? for something that's not CMOS come in. Well, if we look at what we have to compute, and we apply those boundary conditions of where it has to happen, that might give us an opportunity, an opening for economic advantage, for performance advantage, for all that utility function to be realized. And uh, we look at this over um, 11 different design envelopes from, from tiny little sensors all the way up through exascale HPC megaton or me, uh, me, milligrams to metric tons, millimeters to kilometers, microwatts to megawatts, incredibly diverse set of boundary conditions that we begin to apply. And when I think about those HPC workloads of tomorrow, 
They're going to utilize this entire table. They will utilize all of these things. We had the question during the BOF about uh, you know, embedding inference. And in, even 10 years ago, I had a conversation with a, with a real estate developer. And he was used to developing tech campuses. And he wanted to know, how many flops does he have to have underneath each desk? How many flops should he have at every column on the pillar of the floor? How many on the base of each floor? How many in the basement of the building? Because what he wanted to know was, low latency inference <laughs> flops, how, how many and how dense. How dense should we embed computational capacity for inference in our three-dimensional world in order to take advantage of this? And, and again, I'll underline inferencing at the edge. And it's, it will soon, I think, be dominating most of our discussions, talking uh, anecdotally with a friend at a large social media company. And right now, they're doing about 100,000 inferences per user per hour. You know, they only have a quarter billion users. What happens when it's all 8 billion of us? What happens when it's not just one or two hours a day, when every interaction that we have has hundreds of thousands of inferences? And some of those are going to be super low latency. Break, left, right, accelerate. You know, those are going to be measured much faster, much lower inference than bulk inference about using a, uh, an entertainment uh, media experience where we have the benefit of human perceptive lag time to hide latency. So that pervasive utilization of inference and understanding it. And again, for, for this community, when we see that kind of build out in the commercial consumer range, we should be asking ourselves the question, and this is for defense as well, should we be utilizing these structures? Can we benefit from the build out that's going to happen? Or are we going to find ourselves sidelined? So I think it's going to be certainly going to be a question when there is abundance, shouldn't we use it abundantly? When there is scarcity, shouldn't we be being very uh, circumspect about how we utilize these technologies? So a little bit, one last thing, and let's see if I got, oh, I still got time, good. Uh, a little bit more about, uh, about what our, our research program is. And in these things, it's, it's, it's coming back to the question. And we, we had it during the BOF as well. And, and I, I got my scars, uh, and the timelines were just about the same. I made an accelerator. And by the time I got the accelerator made and got the library written and got the, got the in my case, the proprietary enterprise software community to, to, uh, to adopt it, what was a 10x or better improvement was meh. Right, so understanding that time to solution for accelerated compute and realizing two things. One is that constant improvement curve that we've seen for general purpose microprocessors as powered up by that device physics. Now that one's, that one's tapered off, so there's a little bit more runway there. I think the other open question for all of us is given this refactoring of the problem from it, you know, from the end of Denard scaling, it was all about the biggest microprocessor, general purpose microprocessor I could fit on a reticle and have a high quality yield. That led to monoculture. That was, that was increasingly reducing the number of design starts that we were afforded as an industry, but it made economic sense while the tailwind was there. As that tailwind peters off, and we understand now, okay, chiplet substrates, but maybe I'm gaining back some of that uh, composability that I lost out before, is it possible for me now to refactor with that packaging and integration with chiplet technology so that I actually have perhaps that ability to more quickly generate a high quality, high yield composite result without having to bankroll and, and you know, if, if anyone's ever priced out a uh, mass set at, uh, you know, at a, at a 14 or smaller nanometer, it is a lot of zeros. So understanding how we get to application-specific acceleration more economically, I think, is a very interesting thing. But for us, we're also looking at um, about novel physics, about novel, what's beyond, again, back to that question, what's beyond CMOS? Or in this case, what complements CMOS as an exotic accelerator? And how can we begin to pull these things in, realizing we have to be pragmatic? It doesn't matter how efficiently a novel bit of physics does a calculation if it's not efficiently consumable by actual application development communities. But again, hey, now I actually have 
AI augmentation in the application development, maybe all these things will converge into a way in which I can take advantage of a narrower window of opportunity. One, the op window might be opened up broader because the general purpose solution improvement is slowing down. Gives me a little bit more time to recoup that NRE cost for value. But also, can I understand how will I utilize these technologies to bridge in so that I don't have to do all this work all over again and can end up with a, uh, an interesting result. And so for us, understanding um, all of these elements together, the automata processing, deep neural weapons, quantum inspired, those are our novel experiments that we're doing in labs in terms of, of, of physics-based acceleration. But then all the pieces together, what is that packaging? How can I package this together in a way that is economically viable? How can I understand how to bridge this in with architectures? What do I need to gasket around to make this enough like something you've already seen, whether that you is someone who is integrating on the circuit board, you someone who's integrating at the rack level, you who is integrating at the software package level, so that it is something that enables me to fit in, but not compromise the potential of a novel approach. And finally, that software stack. Uh, how can I begin to reason over not individual uh, accelerators, but deal with them as a class? You know, several years ago, we were working with Professor Leon Chua from Cal, who you had predicted, you know, the Memristor, this fourth device. He's the father of nonlinear circuit analysis. And, you know, he, when he was early in his career, he had, you know, novel semiconductor device. He spent two or three years developing one device, got the model perfect and then realized that by the time he had finished, there were 10 more novel devices. So he had to take that step back and say, you know what, rather than deal with this as one, can I develop the meta class? And I think that's part of what we're doing here. Now, the last piece that we'll talk about, and, and back to the most exotic of possible accelerators, and we'll, we'll quote uh, Professor Feynman here and his motivation, 1982, uh, and here we are in 2024, so that's 42 years later, and still not quite there. So this has been a technology that's so, uh, so entrancing because of uh, the potential for uh, engineering systems at the quantum mechanical level. And uh, for us, you know, we're trying to understand in full disclosure, uh, we had a low-level um, quantum qubit development team 10 years ago, and they were staring down their microscopes, and they could see their nitrogen vacancy on diamond um, lattice qubits. What they didn't see back 10 years ago was a path to enterprise value. And so they actually pivoted and became our large-scale integrated photonics team because they, I think correctly, surmised that in the next 10 years, moving data, whether it's from rack to rack or from campus to campus, at single digit picojoules per bit was more material to the enterprise than the quantum research was going to be. But we've been re-engaging with this quantum community over the last four years because as we were getting ready to and then de de uh, deliver the exascale computing platforms, people said, I love what you're doing, but uh, for the next one, where do I plug the qubits in? So understanding and, and understanding the potential for integration of quantum as an accelerator in the, in the midterm, uh, and the near term has been really what we've been focusing on. So we're not gonna go and, and blow the dust off of our low level qubit research, but what we really wanna understand is integration at scale and how we can begin to pull all those things together. How can we use the exascale classical simulation to improve the simulation of material science of condensed matter physics in order to get better qubits? How can we simulate back to that digital twin as that new exemplar of a holistic uh, edge to cloud to X scale workflow, how can we use that capability to analyze a problem we actually care about, not one that's just provably intractable, uh, and figure out, okay, if I had so many qubits at a certain level of quality, how would I begin to create a hybrid quantum classical system? Uh, that is, and not to simulate it in extreme uh, detail, because if I could do that, I would, I would just simulate the problem, but instead to understand how we would begin to use these things for purpose in a hybrid quantum classical system. And finally, again, understanding that unified workflow environment. How do I reason over quantum 
in the same way I want to reason over neuromorphic, the same way I reason over analog, same way I reason over any of these novel approaches and give the tools necessary to the operations team, the applications development team, so they can begin to bridge into this world. And as one last thing before we take some questions, you know, the question I always get is when? When, when, when? When is this going to be material to my business? And this was a study from, uh, from Microsoft Research and ETH Zurich. Um, and, then, uh, um, and they did an analysis for, for, we've got several Dr. Feynman applications, and then we have the, uh, the, the Shores application of integer factoring. And my friend Doug Fink at the Quantum Intelligence Report, he said, okay, if you get a qubit uh, a second for a penny, uh, what is it going to cost you? And this was uh, sensitivity analysis over several different factors of, of quantum uh, quality and error correction. And let's zoom in on that factoring one and actually zoom in especially on the time, the qubit count, and the dollar. So uh, the projection was if you wanted to crack one large integer, it was going to cost you between $1.6 billion and $72 trillion. Now, if that's the integer that's protecting my bank balance, don't bother. If that's the one protecting the launch codes, maybe, you know, but still. We know what it's like to knock off zeros. The original genome was sequenced for about $2 billion. Now you can get a genome sequence from a single cell, 100 bucks overnight. So we know how to do this, but this is a lot of zeros. And this isn't just the same problem we had with sequencing, right? As we heard in the POF, originally it's like application specific sequencers. Yeah, we're there. But you know what? Compute got good enough. And so Moore's law, architectural, access to algorithmics, all those things contrived to, to knock off seven zeros on the price of a sequence. Uh, and I think you know, we're still quite some way because these are not bits, these are qubits. The ability of ourselves to engineer using quantum mechanical principles, that's what we need. So what we really need to design these perfect quantum computers is, is the other quantum computer that we don't have. So, understanding how we come together to break through and begin to give better predictions of when and where, I think is another element for us to do. And again, it comes back to conversations that are holistic. And I think that's really what we want to be striving for. That's why I'm so happy to be able to talk to you today is for us to think about, we no longer have the luxury of solving our each of the elements individually and then superimposing a solution at the end really need to have those holistic conversations. So with that, and I'm, I've still got two minutes for questions. Thank you, everyone. But if I do have a couple quick questions. If not, then we can. We got one over here. Hi, Melinda McDade, retired from Dell, February 4th of this year. <laughs> and I was not able to make the conference last year, but I just want to make a couple of points and then ask a question. Um, you know, I was doing SCADA systems on offshore production platforms mm -hmm. for safety and, and uh, flow line reading uh, in 1979. and. In 1990, I don't know, some of y'all may know Jorge Pita. I was working at Mobile, and he, I helped him develop this uh, genetic and neural net code for equity prediction. He saved Mobile so much money, it's incredible. So things are, but it's really cool to see the evolution, how things are going, you know, going forward. And I really enjoyed your talk. My question is, uh, well, first of all, I think data has been the key and the integration has been the key to making good business decisions. But um, the question I have is I believe that people right now are misusing AI, the term AI. It's almost like cloud was, mm -hmm. you know, and, and how do we, is it education we do? What, how do we educate people on what it really is? So I think the, the point is very well taken about, uh, you know, what is this? And uh, one, of the, one of the most valuable things that I personally got from our acquisition of Cray was the Cray Government Affairs Team <laughs> because 
being part of the conversations because it's not just technology. It's a policy conversation and educating people who, uh, you know, they have a vision and it might be remembered from something they saw as a kid about an electronic brain and they're still walking around with that model uh, and they're saying, no, this is really just prediction based on statistical analysis of the input data. It's only as valid as that. Uh, so I think education and, you know, I'm going to, I was given a, a formula very early in my career at HP. Uh, for us at Hillpackard, quality is fitness for use as defined by the end customer. And the important thing about that is it cannot be unilaterally declared. It has to be a conversation. It begs conversation. It begs empathy of the end user. And right now, people have speculatively put enormous amounts of capital and operational investment, data that they got from don't ask me where, uh, to put into these models, and then they're coming to enterprise and say, hey, pharmaceutical company, how would you like to use this model? And you're like, oh, I don't know, because, you know, and it's the same thing for us. You know, we're a global Fortune, I think 150 still, uh, you know, company. Uh, we have people all over the world. That means a, a world full of jurisdictions, understanding. It's a great thing to say, give me a picture of a grizzly bear riding a motorcycle, jumping over Shark Tank, and make it in the style of Picasso's blue period. And you get the picture back and you're like, damn, that's a Picasso. Uh, that's fantastic, but it doesn't mean it's ready to be incorporated in the business processes of a highly regulated, publicly traded global company. And right now, that's that question. Fitness for use and having those conversations, both with the people trying to sell to us, the people who are investing in the capital and operational costs to produce these models. Are they fit for use for particular uses. And I think that's a conversation that we need to be having at a lot. That was the most positive conversation about that responsible uh, generative AI working session at the WEF Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. The first time I think some of those model generators heard from a potential user community about what fitness really means.